This is a test. This station was conducting a test of the emergency broadcast system. This is only a test. <laughs> This concludes this test of the emergency broadcast system. You look like someone who sat in a room. You look like someone who sat in the sort of room that someone who makes their living with pens and ink would sit in. Uh, yeah, this is my workspace here. Um, loads of graphic novels over on that side. Ice guitar, uh, electric guitar. Here, loads of um, history books. Be, I wrote um, a book last year um like history of the world um All right. published last year so uh, th that's been my uh, that i've been pretty much reading nothing but history since then it's um, become a, a new fascination what's your yeah, I've got loads of, uh, loads of um um it's like uh, comic art work as well on the walls what's your what's your history niche <clears throat> I have, it wasn't a niche i was given um a brief to write uh, an entire history of the world, um, basically uh, like anthropology um, about themes through through history from before Homo sapiens to present day. Okay, so it goes, it's you know um, farming um, right up to AI. Oh. <laughs> amazing. I mean, you, your your bibliography is amazing. By the way, if I was a kid, I, yeah, I think you'd be my I think you'd be my favorite author. Well, um, if I was a kid and I, I saw what I was able to do at this age, um, yeah, I'd be delighted, I think, um, the range of topics that I get to do. And I, that's the fun of it, really, um, learning um, new stuff at the same time as trying to write something entertaining. So, uh, well, I, I guess that's my that's day what, job. <laughs> I, I guess that's what I was thinking when I was, when I was thinking what I was going to talk to you about. I was thinking, you know, sort of like built, sort of like built the life that, any young creative person would want you know get to make music and then get to draw and then get to write like that's amazing that you've made that life uh yeah i can't say i'm rich from it but um yeah i'm very happy with uh the quality of life and the things that i do you uh, say so. you say you're not rich from it but are you rich and strange uh yeah i can't say i'm particularly strange either like uh you know, now I'm working from home. I tend not to uh, get have much of a social life, so my strangeness is just like bumping around the walls. And you know. yeah, you see what see what I did there, though. I did a I, I did know a, what you did there. I did a I did an episode the other day with Courtney from the Dundee Warhols, and um, I wish people listening to this won't have heard yet because then I got told that I had to had to go on ice for a few weeks because they had an order of uh, an order of interviews that they had to sort of dribble out into the world first but there, there was a bit where i was so taken with what he had to say that i found myself at one point just saying i think you're great and <laughs> and he kind of went huh, thanks you and can, you can do that in this interview if you like i, I just feel <laughs> like i just feel that's become one of my sort of journalistic niches that I've, i just make people in bands that i really like feel uncomfortable I don't know if it's uncomfortable if you um if you say nice things about them and let them talk about themselves they'll be very happy I think. <laughs> yeah, so that is you have nailed uh, you have nailed part of music journalism. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry for being a bit late. I as I talk about on the podcast all the time, I, I have OCD, and I suddenly got myself in a cycle of uh, checking and compulsions and rituals, um, which I normally do when I'm stressed, but. I wish I am quite stressed today. There are loads of things going on, but I feel a little bit like I'm going to be okay with you. I feel a little bit like your general demeanor is putting me at ease. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry about this. You know, it's just me, the bass player from Card. It's not like uh, yeah, yeah. You see, you say not that. Like it matters. <laughs> be behave. You see, you see, you say that. There's, there's a big part of this podcast which is really about trying to indulge the teenage me. 
and I, I should probably give you a little. I, I should, should probably... just to calm you down. Oh, <laughs> is it here or she? Is it he? This is Hugh. I mean, never been on a podcast before. We've had a few cat. We've we've had a few cats on before. Has anyone ever told you that your cat looks a little bit like Hitler, though? Yes, yes. Someone has done. Someone shared a photo of that. Yes, that's why he doesn't um, like to be seen in public. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's his What's What's his views on Poland? His views on Poland. Uh, he's, 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 he's never seen Poland. He's never seen beyond like half a mile from from here. So uh, he's yes. no idea what Poland is. Yeah, just keep him away from Poland, and we'll okay. we'll be we'll be okay. Um, no, I should probably give you a little preamble of could. I don't know. I don't know whether I did this when we were trying to sort this out, but I came to. So I'm I'm 43, and I came to could quite late. Um, I came in at showbiz, and I thought showbiz was like the most wonderful thing that I'd heard. Like when I discovered it. And I was, I was so, I was like, oh, I've got a new favorite band. And then I went back, and I think I've got Showbiz. I mean, this is a an anecdote that won't mean anything to anyone who is younger than me, but I, I think I discovered Showbiz at the local library, and then, you know, taped it. Home taping is killing music and all that. Sorry that you didn't get anything for. Yeah, that's that. why it's our last album. <laughs> yeah, and then. I went back and I discovered the records before, and I was like, "Oh, could have, could have my new favorite band." You know, all all of my jotters at school, all of my you know satchels and anything that I could draw the could logo on, I drew on. In fact, when I said to my mum today, I said, oh, "I'm speaking to uh, I'm speaking to a member of Could," and she was like, "Oh, from your jotter." And I was like, "Well, they did do other things as well as be on my jotter," but uh, and then and then and then you broke up, and it's been this sort of a. Uh, not a mystery because I know that you, you know, you played and released singles since, but it's always been a bit of a. It's always been a little bit confusing to me why at that moment. So I guess that might be a good place to start. Really, why when I decided that you were my new favorite band, did you piss off? Um, but people weren't buying our records; they were just taping uh, <laughs> from libraries. Right. Um, yeah, it's a really weird time with showbiz. Um, it's it's odd that you claim that as your introduction because for us it was like uh we thought we'd lost a lot of our fans with that album <laughs> right because we were, at that point uh we were um under a lot of pressure from the record company a and m uh you know we had a major deal <clears throat> we'd done um rich and strange and the squarest and that was a hit but it wasn't as big a hit as they would have liked they would like to sell us to the rest of the world so they put us with a producer um to try to create some more transatlantic sounding record and then uh they never released it in the states and they sat on it for a year right. uh, at the same time where uh, Britpop was starting to kind of launch lots yeah. of new bands were appearing suede uh blur were do suddenly doing well again and meanwhile we were invisible uh with our version of uh, british pop however it is and when we came back they they put out um neurotica as the first single they chose it uh and it was a completely different sound it's like a almost like a metal sound louder quiet grungy mm. kind of sound mm. not typical of the rest of the album and then they followed it up with a ballad hoping to crack the bbc radio 2 listenership um so you know we were you know struggling we we were kind of like doing the opposite of what maybe our fans would have expected of, of us uh we'd been unable to do anything for a year um and the album as a result didn't do as well as we would have hoped it didn't break us into new markets it uh and after that we were we were sent back many times to write more hits tried to write more songs like rich and strange uh we demoed loads of songs but we didn't get to tour again because you know we without the record company backing us financially we couldn't afford to tour we had nothing to promote we didn't have the money to tour so we were just going to uh, demo studios, uh, writing more songs, and it became depressing. We were, you know, living on um, money that was meant to last us for a year. And make we had to make it stretch for two years, and in the end, I was the first one to jump ship. I, yeah, um, as you had mentioned, I, you know, I, I drew. I was interested in comics, and um, a friend of mine um, was looking for a flat in London, and I said, um, "I'll join you." And I decided to leave the band and um, 
try to make way in the world of publishing in, in London. The band carried on without me. They got uh, Mickey Dale, who now plays keyboards with Embrace, still a very good friend of ours. And um, they did some more recording, but nothing was uh, released by the record company. Eventually, the band were dropped by the record company and publishers and went their separate ways. Um, and then, do you want me to carry on to like years later? No, 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 no. I sort of, I sort of know where the story goes then. I mean... I'm going to I'm going to be a bit I'm going to play devil's advocate slightly. Do you I was watching I was watching a video on YouTube today of it was like a pilot for a show with Vic and Bob. And Bob and uh, Andy. That's right. Yeah, I've never seen yeah, it. Yeah, before. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never seen it before and I was like, "Wow, okay." Um and I'm a big fan of you know, I like I like Vic and Bob, but I'm a, I'm a big fan of that sort of uh I suppose I suppose they used to call it like youth TV. I'm a big fan of that sort of irreverent, uh, so, that way that we sort of used to make telly for young people in the nineties. I suppose just because it was what I was brought up on. But I know it's in that video that you weren't there. You had like I think I think the I think the description of the video says that you were away, so you've got a friend in to just sort of prance around and play like sort of mime your bits, right? And I guess that, and I also remember there was there was a book I was like obsessed with when I was a kid. It was sort of like a an A to Z of indie and it was very thorough. And there was an entry for Cud. I used to read that book cover to cover. And the, there was an entry for Cud. And I, I always remember it said that you'd signed to A&M because you liked the trumpet on the logo. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's almost part of me, I suppose, here proposing that did, did Cud... Did could take this pop star lark seriously? No, no, really. It's, it's a really stupid game. Um, we were serious when it came to the songwriting and, and performing, but we saw the the ridiculousness of it of it all. Really, um, when 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 there's quotes like uh, we 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 signed to A and because of the trumpet. In a way, that's true because we did love the old Easy Listening records. Yeah, they put out all the Herb Alpert stuff. Um, some, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. All uh, introducing Stereo Seventy was a big album. We used to play a lot. So when they made an offer for us, we were interested because, you know, it's it was the home of easy listening, and we thought that was quite fun. So when we released our first album, we we insisted on using that old logo they weren't using anymore, and putting also available, also not available on A and M, which was a classic thing that they used to do on their albums as well. Yeah. Um. So that's true, but it wasn't, you know, we didn't just sign because of the trumpet. We signed because they made us a decent offer and we and we thought they would understand us. Um, but that proved not to be the case. Yeah. They, they yeah. didn't know what they had. Um, we were probably signed as like one of the last indie bands um, of, of a certain success who didn't have a major deal. I mean, uh, I, I guess the other one. Right on Papa Do Doodle Dandy as well. It is true. I was away, and curiously, I was um, on holiday with someone from A and M, who I made a really good friend friend with. Um, oh right, okay. When we first went over there. She invited me back out, and we did a road trip across uh, um, to Las Vegas and um, New Mexico and the Grand Canyon. Uh, and it was all booked up when we got offered the Papa Doodle Dandy thing, and I said, "Oh, I'd really like to do it." Um, so we we just got a, a friend, a female friend, uh, to perform as me do the miming um so uh yeah but sadly the show never got um picked up but obviously you you can see it on youtube now <laughs> yeah you know it's fantastic i'm gonna get it commissioned um it's I, I guess i guess the thing i think though is you know really as you break up Britpop really blows up you know i don't really i'm a bit i've said this on the podcast before i'm a bit strict about what i consider Britpop. to be honest i think that I think that by '97, it's all sort of like TFI Friday pop. It's not really what I consider Brit pop, but I do think there's this little window where there's a lot of there's a lot of very kind of quirky, quintessentially British bands who, you know, really starting to get their get their wings, and it it does feel a little bit like maybe if could had if could had found a way to carry on maybe you get swept up in that scene. Do you think it, that's possible? Kind of. 
it's 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 a bit odd um and it's a little bit of a bugbear um if it, there's a famous um edition of uh, uh select for example uh with uh, brett anderson on the cover with the union jack and it it's kind of it talks about this um british scene of music which is going to uh, fight off the um, grunge invasion and uh you know everyone talks about um suede and pulp and denim and saint etienne as part of that but cud were also listed in that we're on the map uh, inside and you know there's an interview with carl and 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 select were really um behind us uh, uh, they were really good to us um but again it's because of that weird year we had with the record company and, and showbiz it didn't really kind of fit into that uh rip pop thing uh even though we'd been around for less time than pulp we we just weren't accepted by that and we i remember um on what was i think it was our on our last headlining tour um park life came out i loved it i, I would played it in the on the tour bus all the time and i thought this is great i didn't think that you know this was going to be a whole new scene i just thought it was a brilliant album yeah um and as it was uh you know we were we were accepted into that kind of scene and yeah you know, we were we were in we were never accepted into any scene really we were like uh you know maybe we were part of popularly the kind of popularly self wonder stuff kind of era or i don't know yeah yeah it's i mean i i did an episode with andrew harrison who worked at oh yeah andy yeah no idea yeah. yeah worked at select uh, uh, during he was, that time. he was the editor of select the whole time I always get confused that when he, I always get confused by what roles he had very at various points. But was he editor of the Yanks Go Home cover? Uh, hmm. I, yeah, I think he was. I think he was. But I knew Andy. We felt, um, most of us knew Andy when he was the editor of Leeds Student Magazine. Uh, oh right, right. When, you know, I, I did some um, uh, reviews, live and album reviews for the Leeds Student, and, and even a comic strip for them. Oh, amazing! So uh, yeah, I knew Andy Harrison and Jay Rayner was the editor for a while. Oh, nice! No, he's he's so, he's one of my favourites. Um, hello, Andy, if you're listening. Yeah, um, hi, Andy. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> we've been in touch on and off. You know, so. Yeah, yeah, no, he's a good guy. Um, yeah, no, but I mean, didn't didn't someone try to attach the term lion pop to you for a time? Yeah, Stuart McConey did that. He did a whole. Um, he, he it was I think it was a review of um actually it might be a review of a uh, Aquarius if not Showbiz. Um, and again, he was trying to create a scene, a line pop scene. So it was, again, it was us, Saint Etienne, Denim, and then the name didn't pick, uh, uh, do well. So he um, tried Britpop, and that did um, carry on. People picked up on that, um, uh, but you know, we we weren't accepted as as part of that, and we've kind of faded away. <laughs> Are you content with? I mean, this is this is presuming a lot of you that you would see us that you would see things in such a lofty way. But are you content with Cud's legacy, for want of a better term? Um, let's not say. I, yeah, it's, it's a difficult thing when you start out. You'd like really excited to have a peel session and really excited to get a single, and then you you have um, higher and higher um, expectations and um, desires. Um, I think. I, I find a little bit of frustration uh, when I think think back to Cud. Um, I'm really proud and really amazed that we put out so many records and we toured as much as we did and that we still have people listening to us today and coming to our shows. Um, but I, I do feel frustrated about that um, end of the year period when um, the record company just kind of really didn't understand what to do with us, um, didn't let us be ourselves. Uh, didn't know what to do with the songs that we did deliver, uh, and maybe jeopardised um, our career as a result. Uh, so yeah, it's a little bit frustrating. I would have liked to have toured more international, internationally and see more of the world, but um, you know that wasn't to be. But hey, you know, be many bands that never make a record or make one record and disappear. You know, we 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 got in the top forty a few times. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. We played Glastonbury, played Reading, we played all these huge shows and. Uh, so yeah, it, when I think back, it's been amazing, and it's still huge fun. Yeah, I think, I think. Well, firstly, I think if you're ever feeling downhearted about it, I did an episode the other day with a man called Giant Killers from Grimsby, who was I can't I can't can't remember who they were signed to, but that the, they were rip 
Brit poppy, I guess, for want of a better term. It sort of sounded a bit like the lightning seeds or even someone like Animals That Swim. And they got dropped uh, after two singles and they've only just put their record out now. They put their record out 30 years later and it's a, it's a lovely record. And when you, it was a really interesting episode because the whole episode was them, you know, they, they had quite a positive take on things. They were like, oh, well, our lives worked out quite well. You know, we we met people and we had kids and, you know, we had different careers and we're, we're kind of happy with what happened to our lives. But, you know, it really it also was trying to sort of put a brave face on when you sort of rem- remember the haplessness of the music industry and how seemingly not driven by art it it, it is you know that there's so many arbitrary reasons why bands make it or don't make it but i do think that with could i do think if you think about you know indie music from the late 80s to the mid noughties in britain i do think could are an essential name within that mix well some of the things you mentioned there um uh very interesting because uh I, 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 recent recent years, I've tried to pitch a book about um, Cud, about how not to succeed in the, the music industry. <laughs> yeah. Just what you say about um, music and art there. Yeah, a lot of our decisions were like we we choose the artistic route. We thought like this would be really interesting, or this would be really different or funny, uh, rather than um, doing something which the the breadheads, uh, the accountants would approve of. Um, uh, I, I, yeah. I, we we would examples are it's not really particularly arty, but when we got our first uh, major, uh, when we got our major deal, we insisted on um, recording it with uh, John Langford from the Mekons, uh, who was a friend and someone we respected from Leeds, and we, yeah, uh, uh, and it, it went against what the record company wanted, and we didn't actually realise that apparently they'd um, they'd had a, a fallout with the the Mekons, and so it wasn't. Wasn't very popular in the in, at A and M, um, but we we persisted with it, um, and we we actually sacked a very good producer prior to that because um, he sat in the uh, the drummer's um, chair, uh, stool, is <laughs> basically his seat on the bus. When you're traveling around, there's always a kind of a hierarchy, and our drummer was very insistent on sitting by the door where right. he stretched his legs. And when this producer sat in his chair, the drummer came out and said, "I want him out." Can't work with him. <laughs> so, wow. All these really ridiculous, arbitrary decisions w- that were made, which in you know, in retrospect, may have um, had caused our career some damage, but they're also funny when we think back to them. Yeah, yeah, I do think there is something glorious about failure as well. I do think there is something uniquely British about failure. I, I, I really want to read that book, so please do please do pursue that. <laughs> well, I did start writing it. I did pitch it to a publisher, and they, they had some interest. But I guess it's a difficult thing that um, cut on to a, such a big name that, uh, you know, I have to make the book funny and sell uh, um, from from my writing, not, not particularly from um, the name of the band. And I, w- I will use this moment to introduce uh, this Geezer comic, which is, in a way... Um, Includes um, some of the my experiences in the band, and also the, the, what you're talking about about the British kind of uh, love of failure. Uh, if you're not aware of Giza, it's about a Britpop band that no one remembers, but they were around at the time of as everyone as everyone else. But they made so so many particular mistakes and enemies that uh, they they never had the success that they thought they would do. You've done a Kickstarter for it, right? Yeah, we've we've launched. Uh, we did me and Philip Bond um, did I've done two, two two issues so far, and the plan is to do five issues. Uh, I've written it all already, and it goes through every period of um, uh, Britpop. It goes from actually prior to Suede, so there's a whole kind of like wearing polyester and uh, bringing kind of like androgynous romance to music uh, against the the wave of. Um, of grunge and uh, noise pop so um and then it moves on to another period with um more like uh you know camden booted and suited blur kind of thing and then on to the parkers and um the drugs and <laughs> yeah yeah i'll have to, I'll have to I... that went through that scene uh 
I, I, I will investigate and I implore anyone listening to the podcast to do that as well. The first thing I thought of was, are, are you aware of Phonogram? Uh, we were uh, published by Polygram. Uh, no, sorry, There's there was a comic called... Oh, Phonogram, is that uh, Kieran Gillen? Sure. Kieran Gillen and Jamie yeah. McKelvey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which, was, which was not not what you're describing, but it was, it was kind, of, kind of this weird sort of interdimensional this sort of interdimensional sci-fi story book that revolved around Britpop and post Britpop and had a glossary in the back of every issue so it was amazing and then the, the covers were these amazing sort of parodies of I've seen the covers I certainly have not read, read it I should do yeah it's good yeah it's, it is good it's it, um yeah I said so wrote some nice things about uh Giza a couple of weeks ago so I Oh, yeah. nice! I need to I need to meet the guy and have a chat with him about uh, the Britpop years and stuff. Because apparently he's got some stories. <laughs> yeah, no, I like that. You did some stuff with Deadline, right? Yeah, yeah. The, this was at the same time as Cub were around, um, and obviously there, there were lots of um, there was lots of crossover with Tank Girl wearing Cub badges. Um, but yeah, I used to do a strip called Nomo about a, a girl who believed in a fish god and was slightly exploited by him. Oh, right. Uh, okay. But then that's how I met people like um, Jamie Hewlett and Philip Bond, and uh, you know I'm working with Philip Bond on on Giza now. Oh, amazing, amazing! I'm I'm a bit too young for Deadline, but I have gone back. You know, I should I should say, and I'm nowhere near of a level that anyone should have any interest in anything I do. But I do make little DIY comics as well. Uh, it's sort of been slightly on the back burner for a while, but I went through a period of doing a. Uh, like a personal strip, like every day for that must have been about three years, and it it's one of those things that when I go back and I look look at about one to seventy, I can't believe that I was, I can't believe that I was stupid enough to show them to people, you know. But I I, I do find when I meet other people who can draw draw properly, draw to a level that I would like to draw, uh, I you guys are my heroes, and I do I do always kind of think. Oh, I wish I'd been around for Deadline. Well, Deadline was great. It was unruly, um, but it was an amazing time to be in comics. Not just Deadline, but there were other titles like Revolver and Crisis. Uh, uh, there was a lot more money around, a lot more parties. Um, now it's um, more splintered and there's not, not so much opportunity. But there's things like you describe, a lot more of um, an indie scene. People self-publishing, crowdfunding. Um, so when you go to a big comic convention like Thought Bubble, there are so many um, like indie producers. People can express themselves, tell their personal stories. They don't have to try to, you know, walk around with a portfolio, talking to about one or two editors, um, you know, with their stories with with pictures of like Batman. You know, they yeah. can do whatever they want, and um, so it's a really good time for comics now. Yeah, but people always say to me, "What kind of comics do you like?" And I always say, "Well, if it's about someone who's just found out they've got cancer, or if it's about..." you know, someone growing up in a war-torn part of the world, then I'm all in, you know, that's the sort of stuff that I like less kind of uh, the flash. Like, or... Do you like Joe Sacco? For... <laughs> do I? Do <laughs> I? Yeah, no, I love all that stuff. Um, I'll, I, I, I'll, recommend, I'll recommend a book to you now. Um... For the benefit of those listening, Will has stepped away yeah, from the microphone. This is, um, I don't know if you know this one. Oh, hello. Al, Al Dongo in Waves. Okay. This is a beautifully illustrated book. Um, oh, that looks right. About, nice about him and his girlfriend's love of surfing. Um, but what you mentioned about illness, uh, yeah, it plays a major part in it, and it's a really moving story. And it's the it's the only graphic novel I, I, I've read in in decades that's got a lump in my throat. It's um, you know, it's, I, I recommend that in waves. Amazing. He's working, he's working on a new title at the moment, which I um, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to to do a little bit of work with the um, scriptwriter. Yeah, I went to Thought Bubble. God, it would be. Um, I haven't been. I mean, the pandemic happened not like long afterwards, but I think I went to maybe the last one before the pandemic. Uh, I'm from Doncaster, so you know, a trip to Leeds means I can see my parents and parent. Oh, 
No, I don't want to make it too heavy, but parent. Um, but yeah, no, I, I went to that one, and I know Gerard Way a little bit from my, my chemical romance. And oh, that he... was the Leeds one. Yeah, he had massive cues, didn't he? Lots of um, people wanted photographs. I, I went to that one as well. And it's funny, I bumped into um, Cass from the census things, if you uh, know him. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've yeah. uh, known him for years, um, and uh, he, he brought his daughter, who was like obsessed with Gerard Way and wanted to get to meet him <laughs> yeah I, I felt like a real knobhead actually because i texted him and he was like come to this door and i said hello you know and felt a, <laughs> felt a little bit like i was sort of ex exploiting my connections I, I should say for the benefit of anyone listening but also yourself that i have a friend called Haley gullen who recently uh went through chemotherapy for breast cancer and she's made a comic about her experience of having breast cancer and it's it's really it's really really good so people should check that out um where's <laughs> don't want to be too accusatory but you have been talking about a new could record for ages yes and uh, we we talked about it coming out about uh, 10 years ago or something like that yeah uh, uh there are various um excuses for that one is that i don't live in leeds with the rest of where the rest of the band are so we don't get together as a four piece very often um but we have recorded stuff and we were basically have recorded enough stuff for an album. Um, but then COVID came up and we decided to start releasing it. So like, Hey, we can't tour. Let's put out a single, let's put out some of the songs. So since we got back together again, we've released, you know, about 10, 12 songs, um, uh, as singles. Um, oh, so those singles are basically been you peeling off this new record. Exactly. Exactly. And there are still a few, Things, songs that are banked and a few things are unfinished and need to go back to the need to go back to the studio and uh, complete you know do some edits and stuff like that so conceivably we could compile everything with the with the, the remaining stuff and put out 12 13 track album um and that is still the aim um and every christmas after we finish a tour we say hey let's do that let's let's get in the studio get those songs finished put out the album and for some reason, it, it kind of never happens. You know, I, I have actually sent emails to the band um, several times this year. So, hey, it'd be really good to get this album out before we, we tour in the autumn. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it just kind of. What's, what, what's your touring plans this year? Do you have a tour booked in? Um, it's not announced yet, but we do have some shows um, lined up. Well, That's one show. We do have lined up, which is a big uh, kind of mini festival with uh, Embrace again, our friends. Um, yes, I, I saw this. I was like, I'm pretty sure everyone on it has been on the podcast. So yeah, I saw, I saw feel a little bit like that my logo should be on the post. Embrace, Ocean Color Scene, Ash, Sleeper, and us. Well, so it's I, day. Hopefully, the weather's good. It's going to be in front of the ruins of uh, Kirkdale Abbey, just on the outskirts of Leeds. Yeah, and that sounds really good. Um, so yeah, really looking forward to that. Um, we've got another show, uh, which I think we've signed up for, which I can't say what it is, um, about a month before. And then we're looking at some dates in the summer, uh, or autumn. Um, it's become an annual thing now. Um, we've stopped making excuses. We've stopped saying, Hey, this is 30 years since this, this is, um, yeah, the, you know, this is all the singles. This is like whatever. So yeah. We, just go out because we enjoy it really yeah i mean I, I i told a couple of friends today that you were coming on the podcast and you know i, I you know I, i'm i'm very active in promoting this podcast and i tell people who i'm speaking to and you know sometimes people get excited but more often than not it's mild indifference but people were delighted that i was speaking to a member of could for this podcast so that affection is so there um Did they say, like are they still going no, no, actually, well, no, actually, there was a friend of mine, Julie, Julie Weir, who works in the music industry, who I think she'd been to see Cud last year, mm -hmm. and or maybe it was a year before, and I remember saying, oh, you know, could, could you help me get to Cud? And um, and she was like, oh, no, I'm just a mega fan, but I love them. And then I think she uh, she said something really sweet about Carl that I won't repeat on the podcast because it'll be embarrassing. But uh, I think she called him a ginger unicorn or something. And... Um, but no, 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 it's there. You know, it's like the the love for Cud's there. But I also think there's there's love for so many bands of your, you know, that, that 
people want to revisit the stuff that they loved when they were younger. This, this is why I do this podcast. It's not just that, yeah. As we get a lot of uh, original fans, but yeah, obviously we've been going around so long now. But they, they're now bringing their new sweethearts, their, their wives they never had. Yeah. And so, or their kids who are old enough to go to gigs. Um, so, yeah, it's great to see, you know, some young faces there but yeah we 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 really we really appreciate the fact that the people stick with us and a lot of them come to more than one show on the tour it's amazing amazing well listen i feel like we should go out with a big question so i'm gonna ask you a big question did your manager really see morrissey in a prawn no (laughs) but the the story is um i know you're talking about a a song called only a prawn in whitby um it was Basically, the manager was in, uh, as far as I understand, he was in a chip shop in Whitby and saw someone who looked like Morrissey at a time when pretty much every student looked like Morrissey. Right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, this this guy, whoever it was, looked like Morrissey and a fish or a prawn or whatever like that. Mm-hmm. And, so, yeah, it's just, it's it's ridiculous, really, that this story is carried down. It's also a ridiculous title for a song. <laughs> but again, it's one of those quirky things about Cud, you know. Um, it makes it makes it very hard for us to be taken seriously when we have a song called "Only a Prawn in Whippy." Yeah, I'll always remember. I mean, I was saying I was saying this before about how much uh, you know how much mirth was in Cud, but I do remember going to the Counter in Track Records, rest in peace, in Doncaster when I was when I was a kid. And I, I'd got showbiz, and I was I was mad on that. And I remember going up to the counter and going and saying, "Excuse me, do you have a copy of Leggy Mambo?" And I just remember the guy behind the counter that was a very serious kind of cyber goth type, just kind of looking at me and gi- and giggling like I just made up some words there. Well, that's how the title came about, Leggy Mambo, our, our third album. It had got to that point in the studio where we'd recorded it and we didn't have a title because it's you know. We, you don't record albums generally with a theme. Um, you know, it's just like we've got all these songs. Have, we've you, have, you, not heard of, have you not heard of Genesis, Will? Well, we, we did our first album, we did call a, a concept album. We did yeah, concept. It was, I mean, it was a concept record. <laughs> yeah. But our second, well, um, our second studio album, Leggy Mambo, um, it was a bunch of our best songs, basically. Yeah. Uh, nothing to connect them apart from us playing them. So we just threw a few words words out and put them together um leggy was a um, leggy mount batten the um manager of the ruttles mambo was just i think mike just came out. i think it was just like choose a number choose two numbers and open a dictionary and see what it lands on right, right. um and then it was it was actually leggy mambo gold top copy because that was um uh dave gregory's um lovely guitar that um, he used on a couple of solos on the album so uh yeah, it, never, it, ne- it never didn't mean ch- anything, but it just kind of fell together, and so yeah, whatever. Never change, Will from Cud. Yeah, so, all our albums have got stupid titles. Aquarius, you know that that was basically Carl was um, playing lots of um, Godspell and uh, and songs from Hair when he was DJing uh, in Leeds. So he was really into things like um, the Age of Aquarius and all that stuff. And I suggested um, calling the album the Square Album, uh, but just because it was round. Um, yeah. And so we put the two together and made Aquarius. And... Well, I like, well, not, I like that. That sounds, that sounds mystical. That album title. I feel like you know. I feel like as you go through the run of records, it's starting to be a little bit more, you know, palat- palatable. I, I say, you mentioned that like uh, a long, uh, undelivered uh, next new album. We do actually have a title for it. We've had it for several years is, is this a podcast uh, thankfully, exclusive i'm not going to tell you what it is oh thankfully, thankfully nobody has, has used it yet but uh we're, we're hanging on to it and hopefully we still like it when oh. we get around to putting out the album i thought i was gonna i thought i was gonna get a scoop then um It'd be embarrassing listen, to announce it before the album listen will thank you so much for giving me some time uh i feel like i, I definitely feel like i've ticked off I definitely feel like I've ticked off speaking to a member of a band on this podcast that I've wanted to do since the very beginning. Uh, and I would like you to know that if you're ever feeling a little bit a little bit downbeat about Cud's fortunes, which I don't think you should do because I think there's so much love for you out there, I would like you to know that A&M might have dropped the ball, but you did go to the top of the pops in my heart. 
<laughs> it was going really well until that point. I was I was trying to work out how to get out of it. Then this is this is the bit okay, where I make fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. I'll, this I'll is the bit where that. I make you feel uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. I feel uncomfortable. Yeah. So well. And we should wrap this up. Maybe so, maybe so time to go. Good. Um. Listen, everyone should check out your comic and uh, keep their ears to the ground for when that new record does come. Yeah, follow us on social media, the usual places. We're not, despite what you say, we're not that hard to find. We're not that hard to contact. Um, well, it ended up being really easy in the end. But I, w- I will say this. I had, had, I had tweeted at Carl quite a lot, and I realised that that was probably the problem. Yeah, he's, the, he's been the problem since the very beginning. <laughs> Will, very nice to speak to you. I'll speak to you again. All right, take care. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye.